Dok. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the US Green New Deal Promises, Policies, and Prospects presented by Foreign, Foreign Policy and Focus. How's that for alliteration? Uh, I'm Brett Fleischman, Director of Finance Campaigns for 350.org. Thank, thank you to Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies for hosting this event. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. If you'd like to switch to Spanish, we have interpretation um, and you can click on the interpretation button below and we will be monitoring, monitoring a Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can click on the Q&A button below as well and drop them in and um, we can get to your questions. I hope we can do so. Um, this is the US episode of a series on Green New Deal around the globe. Um, so it's been three years since Rep. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey introduced their Green New Deal resolution to Congress. Since then, other Green New Deal bills have emerged on education and housing and cities. Um, and U.S. cities have established Green New Deal initiatives, and the Green New Deal has become a rallying cry for U.S. climate activists. For me, the Green New Deal started in November of 2018 when a couple hundred young people organized by the Sunrise Movement sat on the floor and hallways of Nancy Pelosi's office calling for a Green New Deal with a just transition to 100% renewable energy. Today, however, uh, many of the actual components of the clean energy transition have stalled in Congress and some of the funds have been appropriate, some of the funds that have been appropriated have um, yet to reach the communities that need them most. This evening, we have three experts to look at what the Biden administration has done, hasn't, and still could do to implement a transformative climate action towards a Green New Deal in the United States. They will access, assess the state of play in Congress, and they will look at where the rubber hits the road in terms of the federal funds for renewable energy job training and green infrastructure reaching states and localities around the country. So here to unpack, forecast and pontificate are Rajiv Sikora. He's the senior policy advisor for US Rep Jamal Bowman. He was uh, the primary researcher for Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything and the senior manager of research at The Leap. We have Susie Strife, the Director of Sustainability, Climate Action and Resilience for Boulder County. Um, and she directs all and manages all of Boulder County's sustainability efforts, policies and programs with a special focus on clean energy finance and climate action. She also teaches at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, last minute switch up sitting in for Rebecca Lieber who was unable to join us today due to illness. We are so lucky to have with us Saul Levin, who covers climate, labor, and transportation policy for Congresswoman Cori Bush. He was previously a senior climate advisor to Representative Deb Holland before she was appointed Secretary of the Interior. Saul formerly headed the Harvard Climate Leadership Program. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do some context setting before we open up this conversation. Um, in some ways, in the US, the Green New Deal and the Build Back Better bill have become synonymous. They're not the same thing. However, the BBB is seen by many as the biggest step in the direction of the Green New Deal. And I think it's a good place for us to start today. So Joe Biden had expected to arrive at COP26 with Build Back Better bill signed in his back pocket, slap it down on the table and start a bidding war with the Chinese. 
as Bill McKibben likes to say, um, but that didn't happen. And the Senate, Senate Democrats are today preparing to make one last push for a deal with Joe Manchin on a huge party line tax and spending bill. Lots of talk about Memorial Day, May 30th being the new deadline, the last gasp before uh, the battle for the Senate control takes a hold of Washington, DC. Manchin is open to a smaller bill focused on raising taxes on the rich and big corporations married with prescription drug reform and climate spending. Democrats need a total party unity in the Senate and can lose only five votes in the House if they want to pass anything. Using their shot at a reconciliation bill before it expires on October 1st could be the last chance Democrats have to get major legislation done this year should they lose one or both chambers of Congress this fall. Democrats united just over a year ago to plow 1.9 trillion into the fight against the coronavirus, a bill that helped accelerate um, economic and job growth. Now it seems Manchin and Cinema have major concerns about inflation when it comes to government spending that will need to be addressed. And of the very little details that we know about what's on the table, there are rumors that Manchin Manchin's requirements include a push for short-term fossil fuel production in exchange for alternative energy, as well as completely dropping hopes for government expansion. So I think it could as good a place as any to start the conversation um, for the entire panel, Raj and Saul and Susie. Uh, there's plenty of justified skepticism, which I'd love to hear from you all about the about a climate bill happening this year. Where do you land on probability? What are your predictions for meaningful climate policy this year? Raj, do you want to get us started off? Sure. Thanks, Brett. And um, thanks to uh, IPS for organizing this. Great to be here with everyone. Um, I, I, you know, I can't say that I'm terribly optimistic, but um, I do, I feel an obligation to channel my boss's optimism, nonetheless. Um, I, I am here, you know, in my personal capacity as as uh, Saul is to, you know, not officially representing our bosses when we do stuff like this. But, you know, I think the way that that Congressman Bowman has put it is that it's on life support. Um, it's not, it's not completely dead. Um, you know, uh, my boss co-led a letter with Representative uh, Sean Caston, sort of asking the Biden administration to re launch negotiations. We've seen that that has um, started to happen. Um, but, you know, M Manchin is not to be, you know, he's clearly not to be trusted. Um, it's it's very uh, unclear what's going to happen. And I think, you know, stepping back, um, we're not going to pass substantial federal climate legislation at the scale that we need without making a lot more noise without being a lot more disruptive without finding ways to um, counter the power of, of fossil fuel industry and, and other corporations that are lobbying furiously against it. Um, and I think one major uh, force that's pointing in the right direction is what we're seeing with the labor movement in general, you know, um, uh, you know, stuff like Amazon, Starbucks, like there is hope for a counterforce in society that that might be powerful enough to, to get us there. So I think we're going to do everything we can. Um, you know, we're not we nobody's given up, but um, can't promise. <laughs> Song. Yeah, I mean, hi, everybody. Um, I, you know, essentially think that I agree with Raj. I think it's a long shot. Um, but I think, you know, what's interesting about this moment of build back better is to think about what are the points of leverage? Um, you know, what makes it more or less likely? Because even if it's very unlikely, we need to give it everything we have. Um, to try and get it across. And even if it's very likely, we still need to do everything we can to get it across. And so I think to me, like what I'm really interested in is like, I think it's pretty unlikely, but I also think like we're 
already totally screwed from a climate justice perspective and like will be somewhat less so if we're able to pass this in some form. And so what I think is really interesting is to think about what are the points um, and sort of tension points that we can push on. And I think, you know, the House already did its job and it's come down to Senator Manchin and it's like, who has leverage over Senator Manchin? Members of the House of Representatives do not have leverage over Senator Manchin. Um, you know, Speaker Pelosi doesn't really have much leverage over Senator Manchin. So I think really the question is like, are President Biden and Senator Schumer going to do their job and hold their party together? And the answer so far has been a resounding no. Um, and I think, you know, my personal perspective, um, which is also rooted in a good amount of science, is that it would be an international disgrace for the Democratic Party to not pass substantial climate legislation this Congress. And so I think what I'm interested in, Brett, the answer to your question is I think the probability is probably about here. But what I'm really interested in are like, what are the things we can do to get it here to here and just like try and improve the odds because we just so desperately need to. Um, and I also, you know, I like to point out that the bipartisan infrastructure framework had a lot of good things in it. But every study, even, you know, studies that from my perspective are quite conservative, um, suggest that it, it will create more greenhouse gas emissions then it will reduce. So climate change is getting worse because of the bipartisan infrastructure framework without the Build Back Better plan. Um, and that's pretty much agreed upon and understood. And so when people market that as a climate project, there are climate aspects to it, but its, it's net impact is, a, is actually a problem from a strictly climate perspective. Yeah. Well, Susie, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? We're, where do you think we're going to be in this year? Well, first, I want to say it's wonderful to be here and with, you know, some fresh kind of national faces here, because I, I don't necessarily get to be involved in some of the national discussions as much as the localized discussions for, for Boulder County and Colorado specifically. So thanks for having me. Um, sadly, I, I agree. And Raj, I saw you, you, you nailed it. And I think that this is what keeps me up at night. And I think you're correct, Saul, it's an international disgrace. If it doesn't move forward, it's a disgrace to the next generation If it and this generation um, if it doesn't move forward. And I'll get into this later, but I mean, how many climate-related disasters is it gonna take for us to understand that this is a serious issue beyond belief and that um, communities are now you know, having to respond to, react to, and think proactively about climate um, related disasters, et cetera. So it's putting us in a much more precarious position to do nothing, and it's more expensive to do nothing um, as we continue to sit and wait for, for this to happen. So I, I'm actually very interested to hear more about like the leverage points you're talking about, Saul, because it, it seems like where there's a disconnect clearly between what local governments and state governments are doing and then that push for um, national federal policy and change. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's dive into that a little bit. Raj, what, what strategies can progressives in Congress apply now, given the timeline and, and structure that we're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, it's one question about how we can salvage, you know, build back better in the months we have left and like what we need to learn about going forward. I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer for, for what we can do differently, like right now, um, sort of as, as we've been saying, like we just need to try, we need, we need to do everything we can. We need to be as loud as we can. We need to, um, you know, make as much noise as we can. I do think it's worth noting, like without wanting to be overly backward looking here, um, you know, it, the, like the Biden administration and the leadership of the Democratic Party in Congress did not have a plan to deal with Manchin. Um, I say it again, we did not have a plan. And like, again, I don't hate to be that guy that's like, <laughs> it's just saying how we didn't have a plan because I don't have the exact right plan either, but it's just very striking that we didn't have one. And, you know, people like um, Will Lawrence, one of the founders of, of Sunrise Movement had said something at one point that I think was pretty spot on that we could have taken, because there's legitimate concerns about like, you know, you know, I understand the difficulty when our majority is hanging by a thread and Manchin can switch parties, right? That's, that's a real factor here. Um, but we could have um, gone directly to the people 
as a as a party as uh, you know as a uh, sort of coherent party and and marshaled all of our joint resources across the spectrum of a democratic party to do this gone directly to the people of west virginia i'm paraphrasing what will lawrence said here load up the bill with you know good things for um for the people of west virginia make that blanket the airwaves make that case directly to them we didn't try anything like that so um you know and, and dare mention a vote no right so i think like that kind of as saul said like there's not you know our bosses can can make principled statements and we will and we can stand with social movements and we will um but we do have to ask that question about what um, what's gonna um, you know make the difference for for Mansion, um, and I think yeah, I mean they're just again broadly stepping back, like as we move forward, um, you know we ha we have to make common cause across different movements and not because we did have an unfortunate situation with Bill Back Better where because of the ambition of the bill um, and the scope of the bill, it did it it came down to the sort of like potential. Um, battle between different priorities and we didn't always think holistically about the narrative and how it, it was sort of should have brought us together um there was some of that for sure there was some of that for sure but it like through no no fault of of our own on the, on, on the movement level we were sort of like dealing with this tension between what to prioritize at the end of the day what's going to get cut right um so to the extent that we can make common cause the climate movement can be looking for opportunities to work closely with those parts of the resurgent labor movement, look for creative ways to, to, to be sort of fighting the same fight. Um, that's the kind of stuff that's, that's going to help us. Um, the labor movement is one of the, you know, like I said, the few sort of forces in our society that does have far more leverage than they uh, often use because the leadership is often quite, quite conservative. I'm, I guess I'm wondering if there's anything you can say from from inside DC for us folks outside of like what, what is being done either within the progressive caucus at this point or what negotiation noise you're hearing, what's still on the table. Is there anything that either you or Saul would like to say about um, strategies being played out now um, as opposed to what we could have done? Yeah, Saul may know more than me. I mean, I, I don't think, I at least don't know much more than than you know in the sense that you know we've heard like we're waiting for for what Manchin is asked. He's talking to the White House. That much we know, and we know that you know he you know he's he's asking for specific um, concessions on fossil fuel production, offshore drilling. He, I think he's mentioned very specific like very specific fossil fuel projects, including an LNG terminal, if I'm rem remembering correctly, that he wants. To get approved, those things wouldn't necessarily be part of the legislative text, right? Um, so we've all made it clear in, in a variety of ways that we that that it's unacceptable to not pass the 550 billion plus in climate investments that was in um, that was in Build Back Better, the House passed version. And I haven't I haven't heard that Mansion is like saying any particular piece of that is a no go. It's all have you? It's a good question, Brad. I think it's very strange. Um, no, Raj, I haven't. I mean, the way we need to be acting is like, you know, we're all inside of a house that's burning down and there's like a person standing there with like a fire extinguisher who's just kind of like hanging out, you know? And instead, like for the most part from the Democratic Party, who, by the way, every single senior person in the Democratic Party's legacy is riding on something happening here. Like you can't ride out, you know, roads and bridges as like what you've done if you've been the Speaker of the House for a long time. But also if you're a senior Democrat who's retiring this year, it's oddly quiet. It's it's actually like extremely unsettling and, and scary how quiet it is. Um, so I'll just say that I think people are trying different things, you know, a, a bunch of activists blockaded Joe Manchin's coal plant this weekend, um, a bunch of congressional staff are working right now on a letter to senior Democratic leadership saying like, hey, we came here to work for a reason. And now you guys are like not even fighting for us once it got past our desks. Um, you know, there's a lot of different creativity of people 
you know, trying to trying to think of like whatever research, if like whatever thing that you're doing anywhere in the world, like you need to be figuring out what the connection is to see if that has leverage because Mansion has been unbelievably inconsistent. Like we really don't know what's going to land and like all the normal avenues have been tried, but it's like worth anyone who's like a city councilor getting city councilors around the country. And a lot of these things have happened, but just like figuring out like, what are the things that you can do? Like I'm a citizen who does this type of job, which is affected by climate change in this way, which applies to basically every job. Um, and, and this is why we need you to do something, you know? So I think there's a lot of avenues for collective action that are pretty interesting. Um, also like, this is not our office's official position, but like what I think needs to happen is like, I mean, you know, Joe Biden needs to have more chutzpah about this. And he has a lot of tools that I think would be sub significant, like sufficiently powerful to force Manchin to do something. Like what I tell people is if I was Joe Biden, I would use the Antiquities Act to start establishing national monuments and taking over land to be public on coal fields all over West Virginia, and then doing a live broadcast every time saying Joe Manchin is killing the coal industry this week yet again, until he stopped, you know, like that's, you know, so that's what I would do. Um, but, you know, maybe I have more chutzpah than Joe Biden, or maybe I don't know what it's like to be president, you know, take your pick. But I think um, those are some of the things that I think need to happen in terms of like who actually has leverage over Joe Manchin. Like there's really only like a few people. And so I think we need to keep it in the ether so that it's coming up in those people's minds, even if that's not affecting Manchin, to get them to do something. Because I think, you know, Congresswoman Bush has done literally everything imaginable and some more to try and get him to do it. Same with Congressman Bowman, same with a lot of other people. And so the question is, like, there, unfortunately, there aren't many people who have power. Um, so anyways, that's, that's sort of how I see it in terms of what the structure is. How can you keep this on Biden's radar and Pelosi's radar so they feel like they need to do something about it? Indeed. Um, well, I, I just want to quick say that um, thank you for the questions that are rolling in in the chat from the audience. Please keep them coming and I'll look to weave them into the conversation um, as I can. Um, so Saul, one of the, one of the tools that um, Biden has, has recently pulled out was when he announced the Defense Production Act to secure American production of critical materials for to boost our clean energy economy. And there was a hint in the announcement that um, this would not be the final usage of the DPA in the energy space. And for years, climate activists have been calling for wartime mobilization on the energy transition. How do you see the DPA as a tool for climate policy? And where can the Biden administration go from here with the DPA? Um, energy transition strategies. Absolutely. So the one sentence version for anyone who's not familiar of what the Defense Production Act is, um, is that it's a tool that the president has where if something's in the interest of national security because an emergency has been declared or the president makes that determination, they can use a series of powers, including forcing companies to produce certain things use rearranging federal dollars to produce certain things such as if they were using it to like you know produce weapons during a war or something but it has a very broad application and has been used for decades for energy purposes um and so our team you know the congresswoman and representative jason crow and senator bernie sanders introduced a bill a week uh, a little less than a week ago called the energy security and independence act um, which I'm happy to share more details about, which basically laid out our vision of what we think can happen here. Um, and it basically was $100 billion, $150 billion for various investments in the renewable energy supply chain. And two thirds of that was for the Defense Production Act specifically. Basically, Joe Biden could right now say, we're having this emergency in Ukraine and we're having a climate emergency. We're gonna redirect hundreds of millions and in, in like billions of dollars towards making strategic investments to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels from Russia and Saudi Arabia, et cetera, but also in general. And he just completely has that power. And what this bill is doing is suggesting you could do this for transit and vehicle electrification so that, you know, we're talking about transportation, but also for, you know, heat pumps and other measures to, to reduce utility bills that have soared. I don't know about y'all, but my gas bills over the winter were mortifyingly intense. Um, so I think 
that was the sort of broad strokes of the of the legislation. The one other thing that I'll say is that we need to make those investments now, and that's an urgent priority. And Biden has that power. But one of the interventions of this bill is work, and we worked with very moderate members of Congress from the start to say this is a democratic consensus position. This isn't just a left position, which was we successfully brought in like folks who we don't necessarily always work with on stuff. We're on the other end of the party. And we're, Biden actually doesn't have that money sitting around. Like he redirected like a few hundred million dollars to for electric vehicle batteries, but you know that's sort of what he works with. And we're saying we'll give you a hundred billion dollars to work with beyond whatever you can find pulling out of other places to show that that ambition is ready. If that only affects him to use the Defense Production Act for more renewable energy and efficiency generation, it would be totally worth it even without the bill passing. So it's also an intervention from sort of a messaging and ambition perspective. Well, at the same time, if this passed, it would, we'd be in a much better position. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, that's, that's amazing. And um, looking forward to watching this bill work its way through. Um, you know, we're talking about these sort of like big national policies and really big numbers, and it's hard to, to feel grounded in that space. So I'm looking to turn to Susie and talk about what it looks like to, to spend that, that money on the ground. Um, but I think we need to start where Boulder is at the moment. So Boulder just went through a major climate disaster where over a thousand homes were lost in a fire in the middle of winter. Um, there's lots to learn from the response and fallout of that disaster, including federal and state funding allocation. And I know that you're still very much in the middle of it all, Susie, but what can you say at this point about lessons learned from Marshall Fire Funding? Well, thanks, Brett. And I can't wait to get back to the, the bigger picture conversation because it, it does impact, obviously, our future. So um, as, as you know, Brett, since you're, you're a Boulder uh, resident, we have experienced tremendous wildfires, a 500-year flood event, many of these events that my own children have witnessed from our own backyard. And it's it's regrettably Boulder County, including California, we've become the epicenters of these climate related catastrophes. And it's sort of this tragic irony, right? Where we have, we house a lot of the national labs and a lot of the researchers and science, climate modelers and scientists and engineers that are actually like doing the work that takes to understand how do we get a decarbonized economy. And we are all like packing our bags all the time because of the winds and wildfire danger here. We are responding, recovering and rebuilding, and we will be for a long time. We just finished rebuilding from that 500 year flood, which was in 2013. And so a lot of these federal funds that come to us for disaster response to our local government are obviously coming through as a subrecipient of the state. And so we receive FEMA assistance and HUD disaster relief. And while that's all wonderful, what happens when a community experiences a climate related disaster or any disaster really is it's the hands, all hands on deck all the time for response and recovery. And no matter how much support you get, it diverts attention, resources, staff, everything that we have as a little local government um, to react to these devastating events. And so this is, you know, I, I was astonished to see how amazingly well an organ, as an organization, Boulder County responded to the Marshall Fire. And that's a sad, that's a sad fact to share that we're getting good at re disaster response. Um, and so similar to the public health agencies during the height of the pandemic, all of our departments are activated in terms of resources to ensure that people are safe and housed and able to start the recovery and rebuild process. But there's no playbook and there's just really no way for us to understand like how much is this going to happen. We had a firestorm in December that was put out by snow. So it, it's like these unprecedented events that are taking us away from being proactive to mitigate against the climate crisis um, and what's needed to decarbonize the energy economy or what's even needed to become more resilient to the ever-growing and ever-present climate risk in our community. So I just think that there's just this weird sense of um, you know, reaction and we're not being proactive enough as local governments because we don't have the time and resources because we're continuing to respond again to these disasters. And then what's also a little bit bizarre is a lot of the federal funding and potentially statewide funding that comes to us doesn't require us to build back stronger, build back better, build back in a more resilient manner. 
So that to me is something that needs to get fixed because obviously we're just creating, you know, our own <laughs> future issues as we start to understand the true climate impacts that we're up against and um, the necessary recovery dollars that it takes to actually build back in a stronger and more resilient manner. Susie, you, you kind of got into this a little bit, but I guess I'm interested to paint a picture of mm -hmm. what it would look like if the federal government rained money on local governments and states. What's the dream scenario? What what could you do as a local government um, if federal funding was available to launch a green New Deal or energy transition? Oh, it's just such a fun question to even think about, right? So we are in a unique position at, at Boulder, and I feel like we're a little bit of a unicorn to answer this question just because we've had a lot of support in the past. We had ARA funding in 2010. We received a $25 million grant. We actually applied for $75 million, received $25 million to jumpstart the new energy, kind of clean energy economy. But that was really more about jobs. Um, and then we leveraged that funding over time and showcased the success and then had our own voters vote for, I mean, we pitched it to them to vote for a sustainability tax, the first ever sustainability tax the county has ever done in the country. And that has provided a really good sustainable resource for us to think about and to deploy climate action um, and you know, high impact, meaningful impact climate work here in Boulder County. And the problem with that is, I mean, that's wonderful, but the problem is, is that we're not even reaching our climate goals with that. So in a dream case scenario, we would have the feds, right, have a truly true regulation and policies to back a, decar a decarbonized economy. And then with that, also helping to staff and fund capacity building across all sorts of different organizations at a local level um, in order to, sorry, there's someone ringing my doorbell and knocking very loudly at my door. Um, but basic gist is that every community is not where Boulder is and we need to support the capacity building across all of those types of communities who have climate commitments or not with potential cl climate liaisons that can help kind of demystify how you get from A to B. How do you get to a decarbonized economy? What is What are the incentives and the policies and regulations that we need at a local level to make that happen? So I have a, I have a whole list. I mean, even during the CARES Act, we wrote probably a hundred different letters of recommendation of what potential resources could go to, to support not only, you know, obviously the pandemic recovery, but also what could it look like to have, you know, to reach um, carbon neutrality by 2030. And local governments are ready and primed, but we would need quite a lot of investment in health and staffing and capacity building. So part of part of the uh, blueprint of what you just described, Susie, I think is in, um, in the Green New Deal for Cities bill. And I'm wondering okay. if Saul, you can, you can talk about that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, it was really, I appreciate that, Susie, because I think we're really on the same page. Um, so Congresswoman Bush introduced a bill called the Green New Deal for Cities kind of exactly along those lines. Um, there are communities all over this country and, and the name is a bit misleading. The bill actually would fund, you know, dollars for a Green New Deal in every city, county, territory, tribe, um, state in the country. Um, and it's based off the funding from the American Rescue Plan for COVID. So essentially the same way that all of those dollars were spread around for people to do masking and do, you know, hand sanitizing, you know, different phases of the pandemic, the ways that different funds were used, we, we need the same thing on an even greater scale for, for dealing with climate change and environmental injustice and uprooting environmental racism, which is so pervasive all over the country. And so basically what this bill would do would be to send, you know, share federal dollars with every community in this country to do exactly the types of projects that are happening in Boulder. And the idea would be um, to basically do all of that um, and skip over some of the problematic, wasteful ways that, that things have happened in the past and some of the injustices. And what I mean by that is 
you know, there's a, there's a really big focus in the bill on like trying to send it to money to communities who really need it. There's a focus on sending it to every community so that people aren't having competitive grants where you're more likely to get the grant if you have the resources and then therefore probably need the money less than some other people um, and, and so on. And also like there's no community that doesn't need a Green New Deal. So that's sort of that, the outline of the bill. Um, but I, I think it underscores what Susie's point was, which is that there's communities, every community in the country needs federal support. Like there are tons of communities, you know, they're Democrat controlled. They might even have a progressive city council and they're trying to, you know, but they're kind of nitpicking around the edges for the most part at these like little edges of the climate problem in part because they don't really have the resources to expand transit in the ways that are needed to, you know, do all those kinds of things. And so there's extreme, you know, very significant flexibility within the bill uh, to do those types of things. Maybe Raj, can you follow that up with um, your office's approach in thinking about the Green New Deal for public schools? Yeah, um, and actually, if, if you don't mind, I just want to take a minute to um, yeah. address something I'm, I'm seeing. You know that someone in the audience has commented on sort of the issue of green colonialism. I think it's just worth mentioning quickly that you know a lot of what the policies that Saul and I are working on do involve you know massively accelerating. Um, resource intensive build out of renewable energy, right? That's gonna happen, it, it, you know, under Saul's bill, it would happen under um, my office's public schools bill. So yeah, I, you know, just wanna say that that, that is a, a huge issue, you know, where are the materials for this stuff coming from? Obviously they're coming, you know, heavily um, from the global South right now, places like uh, Chile and, and Democratic Republic of the Congo and, and Philippines, et cetera, right? So we do have to, um, it's not something that, that the Democratic Party or Congress as a whole is really reckoning with yet, but certainly, uh, you know, rest assured, assured that Saul and I and our bosses are definitely grapple, grappling with it. And, you know, we, it's not just about building out the stuff, it's also about reducing demand, right? And we can do that in a way that is not about um, depriving people, but actually about, um, you know, improving people's lives, right? Like public transit is a huge, uh, part of that. And, and that's something that's been, um, not, you know, really, uh, not really focused on in this current moment with high, um, oil prices, which I'm sure we'll come back to anyway. Um, so we, you know, the green deal for public schools, um, this is a, uh, you know, 1.4 trillion sort of holistic investment in, the public the K through twelve public education system. So it has some some education policy in it, but a big piece of the bill is is sort of providing enough funding for every school in the country to get to zero carbon emissions. So that's the combination of like a again sort of a really heavy um, efficiency retrofit to just reduce the energy that the school facility is using, solar on site, um, electrify the the building, and also get rid of health harms and um, you know barriers to accessibility. Right, so get rid of all the toxic materials that are currently, you know, threatening um, young people, particularly uh, of color and 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 low income students in rural communities. Um, so it's sort of the, the, the vision of this that really uh, I think my boss is passionate about is, is kind of putting young people and at the center of our response to this crisis. Um, you know, right now we have, um, you know, a youth mental health crisis in no small part because of the climate crisis, right? And, and what they've been through during the pandemic. But imagine if we were not only starting to do something about this, uh, you know, if Biden were, were to, to, you know, invoke the DPA um, and, and take other measures to actually mobilize the society to, to, to invest where we need to invest. Um, imagine if you as a young, you know, public school student were in a community where your schools have been completely ignored or, and, and actively, um, you know, disinvested in for, for decades. If your school was like, the center, the epicenter of this process, right? And you were able to study the retrofit um, to the building. You were learning about, you're know, participating in all sorts of like community garden and, and you're seeing, you know, the electric school bus be procured. You're dealing with like uh, healthy, you know, uh, climate friendly food, um, you know, coming into the schools for, for lunches. Um, and, you know, 
what you know the idea would be to sort of un unleash the imagination and the creativity of young people and really put that at the center so we're also just the bill also um you know to that end right invests in curriculum development and bringing in a bunch more educators and expanding community partnerships with um all sorts of, of groups um and it would just create a hell of a lot of jobs um over over a million jobs every year um to to do to, to carry out all of the retrofits and to hire all the, the new educators. Um, so, and yeah, I guess the last point I would just make here is, um, you know, the sort of what I was mentioning earlier, right? Like we really need, um, uh, we really need a breakthrough in terms of how climate movement, how the EJ movement can work with the labor movement. Um, and it can't just be lowest common denominator stuff, like some of what you know, we've seen so far, unfortunately, has tended in that direction. Like, where are the areas where we can all get on the same page for radical transformative change? And retrofitting every public school in the country is, um, is you know, one of those things, I think. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of awesome stuff happening around the country on this. Um, where, you know, just in, I was just talking to someone from Seattle, where, you know, teachers um, really were, led this fight um, in coalition with, with the climate movement, but brought the rest of, you know, the building trades on board to demand that as part of, um, you know, sort of the latest round of the uh, school district's bond uh, renewal, that they include $19 million for, for putting solar on, on rooftops. Um, and they won. And so, you know, I think this is a huge, huge area of potential for these kind of coalitions with teachers and climate activists and, and parents and young people to, to come together. Very cool. Yeah, so, so what I've been trying to do here is like paint a bit of a picture of what it would look like on the ground and then some of um, the Green New Deal for cities, Green New Deal for public schools. There's a lot of Green New Deal bills out there. Saw um, the Green New Deal pledge was just launched. Can you tell us about the Green New Deal pledge and what momentum you've built with that so far? Yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, I think it's a, it's a very exciting thing. I think people can uh, check it out right here at this simple GND Champions link. Um, but basically, um, we on the inside of Congress can't take credit for the final product of what came out of this, but uh, we started a project over a year ago to try and figure out what are the best Green New Deal bills that are in Congress. Um, and the idea was basically most people don't have time to read through and there's, you know, hundreds of bills introduced every year called the Climate Act and the Environmental Justice Act and the you know, Green Schools Act and all these different things. And like most of them are just not very good at all. <laughs> and so, um, and don't really have a scale of ambition or a focus on justice um, or a focus on internationalism and, and, you know, some of the different things that, that we need. And so we started out a project um, to identify those bills and worked a lot with different frontline groups to figure out what would be sort of a core list within what the Green New Deal should be. Not to suggest that it's comprehensive because a lot more legislation is needed. Um, and we expanded out to seven bills and then we kind of did a pilot and Raj and I actually spent about six months bothering offices saying, hey, why aren't you, you know, you're signed onto the Green New Deal for public housing. Why aren't you signed onto the Green New Deal for public schools and the End Polluter Welfare Act? And we were just steadily building up support for all of those bills over time. And the levels of support dramatically changed. Um, and part of the reason is that people don't usually do these things collectively in Congress. It's very much set up as an individualistic system. So after a trial period, I went back and talked to a bunch of organizations and got feedback on what's missing. And then three more bills were added to the list to make it 10. Um, and then a bunch of organizations, more than 40, got together and said, we're going to turn this into a pledge. And so instead of just running for Congress as a progressive person in the U.S. now and saying, I'm running on the Green New Deal, the question is, 
have you, are you a Green New Deal champion? And that means you sign on to the Green New Deal and nine other bills that are sort of the best things we have to date. And it includes the bills we've been talking about today, as well as bills to take on fossil fuel subsidies, as well as bills to end new fossil fuel leases on public lands. Um, and it's been very exciting. And just to give a sense of the results, you all can, you know, if hopefully folks are able to click on the link uh, thanks to whoever at IPS put it in the chat correctly. I actually think it's blocked on my computer at this point in time. So, um, but, uh, so when we started, there were four members of Congress on every bill. And now there are like 27. And that was not just me and Raj, but an effort of groups came together once they turned this into a pledge and said, hey, like you're on these seven bills. What are you doing on the other three? I guess you can't list you on our fancy website. And like that really works with members of Congress, believe it or not. You know, that was really a selling point for a lot of them. Or they just didn't know. You know, sometimes they're like, oh, we want to support the best climate stuff. We didn't even know that like a bunch of, you know, inside experts and outside experts and frontline groups that came up with sort of an understood list because there's, you know, more than 45 organizations and it's not just Sunrise Movement and Climate Justice Alliance, it's Black Lives Matter and March for Our Lives and like a lot of different, you know, American Federation of Teachers has signed on to the, to the project. Um, so anyways, yeah, that's sort of the broad strokes. I'm happy to answer questions, but I also want everyone to know um, that more than 45 candidates for federal office have signed on to this. So if elected, they're committing to not only sign on to these 10 bills, but also not take money from the fossil fuel industry, which, you know, we couldn't really work on in our official capacity because it's a campaign thing. But nevertheless, from where we're sitting, it's very exciting to think that more people are coming in who are already there, um, as opposed to, you know, Raj and me having to drag them along to where we need them to be. Great. Congratulations. It's, it's been fun to watch that. And speaking of advocacy within government, Susie, I was wondering if we can talk about the, the question about the role of local governments in driving federal policy. Can, can you talk about some of the things that you've done or that Boulder's done or that you um, want to see more of from local governments in advocating for your own needs, um, calling for the funds and programs um, that you see as necessary now. Yeah, that's great, Brett. And thanks, Saul. I needed that shot of optimism. That's really cool. I love the Green New Deal champion. Count me in. I'm not, a, I'm not going to be an elected official, but I think that's very cool how you framed it. Um, yeah, so I mean, here in Colorado, and I think this is really actually a thread through this conversation about leverage, right? So we often act in coalitions for lobbying, both at the state and fed, for state and federal climate protective policy. And one of the neat things that I've been a part of, right, since 2013, when we really were taking on our greenhouse gas inventories and understanding what really matters at the local level, because this is such a macro issue, right? So all these communities are kind of have this parochial view, and I'm I'm kind of being bold a little bit and a little bit uh, outside of the box thinking, but these communities, we all don't need any more greenhouse gas inventories. We do not need, we have the tools, we have the strategies, we know what we need to do. We have macro kind of idea of where the, the emissions are coming from. And so despite massive investment from the local level in our programs, we didn't see any real dips in, in um, emission reductions during a 10 year mark, except for when national policy and statewide policy was, was initiated, right? Like the renewable portfolio standard um, and other national policies and statewide policies. And so what we started was Communities for Climate Action, basically, which is an umbrella lobbying organization that is bringing together the collective power of now 40 local governments who are basically paying pretty small membership due fees to act under one umbrella policy agency um, and that collective lobbying power is very well respected at the state legislature. And while our mission does include federal policy lobbying, we've been pretty deflated in the last you know, several years, especially during the Trump administration. So we haven't really had the gusto, but the idea right, at, at the national scale is that we could do that state, every state who had some type of climate, community-based climate um, lobbying coalition could band together and provide input um, back to the feds. And so that's something that I've thought about a lot and want to initiate at that macro level, because 
we're not, again, going to be able at a parochial level, be able to achieve sort of the climate uh, results that we want it, because not only because of funding, but because we don't have the national signals, the market signals, the, the national policies that showcase what's possible. So it's been reversed, actually. Local governments have long played that role of, of showcasing what's possible and having you know, deep emission reduction standards and, and um, policies and regulations. But even carbon dioxide removal is something we're working on. But because we haven't had that framework and support and the federal policies to sort of you know, uh, initiate that at a, at a macro scale, we're not going to see the change that that we actually need to to meet the realities of the climate crisis. Thank you. So um, I was just kind of thinking with the last 10 minutes of our conversation, there's been some questions about inflation coming in and oil and gas. Um, maybe we can turn our last comments to um, what we should be doing now. Um, so I think we've covered like the context, we've covered painting a picture a bit of um, what the Green New Deal could look like and what bills are out there um, in a bit of advocacy within government that is currently underway. Um, so maybe it's sort of like, where do we go from here? What are next steps? Um, and, and if we can try to like weave in um, the tension between um, between ca calls for more fossil fuel production, the Biden administration two Thursdays ago announced a release of 1 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, um, trying to lower gas prices and that concern. And I don't know, maybe a, a shift in rhetoric from Democrats calling for increase in production in, um, in response to the Ukraine invasion. And um, so I guess I want to like start with Raj. There's sticks, there's carrots. Um, where, what, what do you think are our next steps to push for the policies that we need now, given the, the condition? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a big one. I, I'll try to be quick. Um, I think, you know, we shouldn't be increasing fossil fuel production right now. Um, <laughs> we can't. The IPCC report that just came out makes that very clear. Um, we especially shouldn't be investing in new long-term fossil fuel infrastructure, which unfortunately, um, infuri infuriatingly, is what is happening. Um, you know, we're, we're scrambling to expand, you know, LNG um, for Europe, for example. Um, you know, I think the Biden administration, you know, at, at the same time, I, I, it, it has to be said that um, we do have to care about the impact of gas prices on, on working class people. And this is something that the mainstream and environmental movement hasn't always been good at, to say the least. That's changing. Um, we are putting, you know, the well-being of, of working class Americans um, at the forefront of our, our thinking. And, um, you know, there, we, have, we have answers, we have alternatives. The Biden administration could have, um, you know, instead of, again, scrambling to get more fossil fuels online that are not going to magically bring down the price of oil anyway, that are gonna take time to, to, to come online. They could have looked at things and they did consider, um, you know, bringing back decommissioned buses or something to that effect and, and, and subsidizing public trans transport, right? And, and we're seeing some of that Kind of experimentation locally, for example, in Boston, where um, you know Michelle Wu, the mayor, is is really uh, has a fantastic Green New Deal platform and is is um, you know one of the centerpieces of her um, of her implementation of that is free, is free public transit. So we also have you know I think um, rep, you know Representative Cory Bush's um, bill that Saul with with Bernie and that Saul just talked about is a huge 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 part of the solution here. Um, and we also have to crack down on, you know, the windfall profits of the fossil fuel industry and other industries right now. So my boss has a bill with Bernie to, to, to do that. And there's several other bills too, that are fantastic that, that we also support. So, um, you know, the fossil fuel industry is, is making very healthy profits. Obviously they, they took a hit during COVID, but we, 
the Trump administration made sure to subsidize the, to to bail them out on top of all the baseline subsidies that they that they get right, and they are um, you know responding to investor pressure right now to to withhold um, production to 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 rake in profits from from high oil prices right now. The solution is not to beg them to appeal to their patriotic duty which is what Democrats are doing to, to drill more. Um, we, can, we can tax their windfall profits. We can invest those profits, you know, which they are using to, to do stock buybacks and shareholder, shareholder payouts, right? Um, we, can, we can take that money, we can invest it in, in other things, bring relief directly to people and invest in the green energy transition. Um, so Representative Khanna and Senator Whitehouse have a bill that does that specifically for the oil industry and provides um, uh, rebates to people. And my boss has a bill with Bernie that's going to do that economy wide because these companies, it's not just the oil industry, right? If you go to, um, I'll, I'll put this in the chat after, there's a great website that's just looking at all these corporations that are bragging on their investor calls about how they're exploiting this crisis and the pandemic to raise prices. Um, and, you know, uh, so our bill is going to, if you're making windfall profits as a temporary emergency measure, we're going to tax that at 95%. Um, so those are a few of the, of the solutions that are, we have, we have them on the table. We got to keep uh, pushing for them instead of what, you know, as an alternative to what the administration is doing. Indeed. So do you want to follow that up with your thoughts on what your office and in general, what should be happening in Congress in the next next steps? Yeah, I think to me, the three things that um, I'm really excited about in terms of international climate policy right now are similar to what Raj said. I think we need to make massive investments through the DPA and otherwise in renewable energy. Um, we need to go after the fossil fuel industry like in a head-on kind of way and i think we need to just send people money um you know i think that not you know there's been proposals to subsidize gas which doesn't make sense because the prices you know the high prices are invented but i think you know i wouldn't have a problem with people um you know doing checks the way that they did during the um you know, during the pandemic, of course, some of us think that should just be a regular practice. But anyways, um, I think in the in the context of a crisis like this, that would be helpful. So kind of similar to what Raj said, but what, what I'll just quickly add is that one of the things that I think is the most exciting for the climate movement right now is the power growing in the labor movement. And I think that um, Raj mentioned this a little bit, but it's long been understood, you know, since the 70s, since before the 70s, that the climate movement is not going to be able to win without, you know, connecting to people's where they are at work, without connecting to the, the strength of the labor movement and the power that's built by like, I'm fighting for what I do every day. And like, I'm reminded every day of that. Um, and also just like the strategic interventions that the labor movement have made. So I think that for a lot of us, like what's What's also giving us hope in the context of international climate policy in the context of domestic climate policy is that in order to win a Green New Deal, like we need we need a shakeup in the startlingly conservative labor movement in many ways. Um, and I think we're seeing just that type of shakeup with the Starbucks Workers United, um, amazing wins that are happening on like a daily basis, it feels, um, with the Amazon labor unions, huge win. Um, just recently, and also let's not forget with the exciting organizing efforts of the Congressional Workers Union here in the House Woo! of Representatives, where um, you know working conditions have long been abysmal and structurally so. Even if your boss is cool, it's set up for you to be underpaid and overworked. Um, and it breaks down, you know, even worse along lines of class, race, and gender. Um, so I think. You know, I, I, to me, that's what's really exciting. Um, so if you're on this call and you're a manager, you should recognize the union voluntarily so they don't even have to go to votes. And if you're not, you should think about your own climate credentials, everyone, because I think that's the only way we're going to win. So, um, yes, but appreciate the question. And I think um, 
Raj really got at some of the climate pieces, but I think a lot of us are really inspired by what the labor movement's doing. And like, just so you know, like we've talked to Chris Smalls and Derek Palmer about what they think about climate change. And they're like, people die and get hurt at Amazon all the time from being forced to work during tornadoes, hurricanes, um, and other climate events. And that's something that we're working on. So a lot of these new unions are young people who are savvy and like are seeing the climate crisis hit them in their own lifetime. And so it's it's a bit of a different tack that some some unions um, whose power is waning have taken. Thank you, Sam. Susie, what's on deck for you? What what are you going to be working on in the in Boulder County? Going to be working on in the next few months um, in building the Green New Deal and advocating for it locally. Well, I'm going to be following up with Saul and Raj because I feel very motivated and instigated on that level to, to be a part of those larger movements. But I think what you said about the labor movement is fascinating because it, it, it's also creating that workforce, right, and creating the labor movement and the clean energy economy. And we're seeing with the Marshall Fire Rebuild, like we're not prepared at all for what's to come if, if any of these, you know, green new stimulus come through in terms of workforce. So I'm I'm really particularly excited about what you said about the, the schools and also building that workforce for decarb because um, we're noticing even just like with 1100 homes, finding uh, folks who are ready and able to electrify, it has been challenging. So we really need to get ahead of that. And I think there needs to be some deep preparation for communities who will potentially get any of the stimulus funding to start thinking through what's possible. And I'm excited to be involved in, in prep preparing um, communities for, for that potential funding. The other component of it is getting, again, like I think Raj said, just getting our youth back engaged. Um, we've heard some, some inklings of, of the climate provisions of the Biden Build Back Better Plan would have sort of this idea of a climate youth conservation core. And as we think about our lands and restoration and carbon sequestration potential, I'm pretty excited about the idea of building kind of a climate youth core out here to get people back outside, building off of our um, need for restoration and regeneration on our lands and soils and whatnot. So it kind of is a win-win-win, right? If you can do carbon sequestration plus getting children out and um, youth out to be a part of the call for the solutions on this stuff, it's it's really important. So. Thank you. Um, and thank you all. I think we're out at time. And I want to send a heartfelt thank you to Susie and Raj and Saul for being with us today and sharing your wisdom and plans and ideas. Um, and I think you can find a recording of this on the IPS Institute for Policy Studies webpage eventually. I'm not sure, John, if you're able to drop a link to where that might be um, in the chat. Um, eventually yeah thank you everybody and um we'll wrap it up there cheers thanks so much brett thanks everyone thank you thank you, thank you.